What is up, my podcast listeners? This is your host, Rafael Matuszewski, and I'm excited for today's episode because I've had a lot of success with my 10 exercises everybody should be doing, but a lot of people ended up reaching out to me and were like, well, well, the light is flickering, so I apologize. Um, we're asking about some specific like mobility and like flexibility things that they could be doing. And that kind of gave me the idea of like, I should probably do a, you know, 10 exercises or like 10 mobility exercises you should be doing. And that kind of triggered like all these different ideas because lately I've been getting a lot of people where they're like, my shoulder doesn't move the way it should. My hip has been hurting. My knee's been hurting. What should I be doing? Because in those situations where you have a shoulder that doesn't move the way a shoulder should, you have a knee that's causing pain because most likely your hip or ankle are doing weird things. Then it becomes any exercise that you're doing in the gym, you're probably not going to get the benefit out of it. So the example I always give is like, say you have that shoulder that flares up, it doesn't move the right way, it feels tight going overhead, and say out of 100%, and 100% is the best shoulder in the entire world. Most of the time, those people with those issues in their shoulder, hip, whatever joint it is, they'll usually tell me that it's feeling at like 40%. And then I tell them, well, okay, now you have a 40% shoulder doing an exercise that you're probably only going to get 40% out of, right? So eventually you're going to get to a point where you hit a plateau with your exercise regimen and that's it. Like you can't progress any further unless you work on joint integrity and the foundation of your freaking body, right? So we're going to go into a series and hopefully I don't talk too long on this episode, but we're going to get into um, the 10 mobility exercises that everybody should be doing. And I'll kind of explain why and also get into real life situations that I utilize these. Now, before I get started, I want everyone who consumes my content, either watching it, listening to it, you're on Facebook, Instagram, whatever it is, if you can do me a huge favor and go on my YouTube channel and subscribe, like, leave a comment, whatever it is, because that's going to help push up my um, channel to more people that can help more people. Because I've been getting more subscribers and people reaching out like, oh my God, these episodes are really, really good. And, you know, my long episodes like this one will get anywhere from, I don't know, like 15 to 30 views. It's not a lot, but those people who watch it will end up messaging me like, oh my God, I wish I found this earlier. And it's just because I need um, my channel to be pushed up a little bit further. And that's one of the reasons why I've been doing a lot of YouTube shorts. I've been getting so many more people viewing my stuff. So if you could subscribe, leave a comment, like whatever piece of content that's out, that would help tremendously. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. And hopefully I can remember how to share my screen so we can get into some stuff. Here we go. All right. I'm going to make myself bigger so you guys can see my lovely face. And hopefully the light doesn't F things up. So right away, I'm going to tell you guys that the biggest thing that everyone should be doing, and there's a fucking ad, of course, um, on a daily basis for mobility is the car's routine. So for those who don't know, and number one, check out my long hair. <laughs> um, CARS is an abbreviation for controlled articular rotation, which is a fancy way of saying that you're going to move your joint in the way it's designed. So the reason why I start with CARS, there's a couple of reasons. <laughs> Number one, it's a self-assessment for yourself and also an assessment for me to see what is going on. Give me a blueprint of how your joints function, what their capacity is. 
So when I have that information and when you have that information, you know what you need to work on. The second reason is that most people don't move their joints through their full capacity. So again, if we go back to that shoulder example, most people use their shoulder to go on their phone, to go on their laptop, and maybe, maybe grab a cup out of the top cupboard. But your shoulder can do all these things back here. But when was the last time you've done this? The only time I think about when people go into those end ranges back here is when you're driving and your phone falls out of your pocket in between that space between your seat and the like center console thing. And then you're like reaching down behind your chair and you're trying to like grab and search for it. And then your entire neck fucking pulls. That's the only time. So your glenohumeral joint, again, your shoulder can do all these lovely things back there. If I'm only using my shoulder for stuff in front of me, then that whole backside of that shoulder doesn't get synovial fluid, all the nutrients it needs, and lubrication in order for it to move. Now, multiply that by 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, shoulders are probably not going to feel the greatest. Same goes for your hips, same goes for your neck, same goes for your shoulder blades, and so forth. So literally, if I had to give one piece of advice and one piece of homework for people out there is literally do cars for every single joint every single day. When I see people and I give them homework, I'm like, literally do cars for each joint, do five repetitions each every single day for the rest of your life, and you will see improvement. That's all. The issue, though, is that people don't do that. They'll probably do it once a week. They'll skip a week. Maybe they do it three times the next week. And then they stop for two weeks. And then they're like three months and they're like, this shit doesn't work. Like mo most people don't put enough effort into anything really. And they just expect the world to come to them. You know, the stuff that you really want in life is going to take so much effort to get there. But when you get there, you feel like you can take on more. And rant. Here we go. Neck cars. We're going to go through the morning routine. Um, I don't know if that's 10 exercises, but we're going to go over neck, your shoulder blades, your shoulder, your T spine, your elbows, your wrists, your hips, your knees, ankles, and toes. Okay. Yeah, we got 10. So morning routine is going to be the first 10 exercises you should be doing. <laughs> And I guess I'm going to have to do a part two for this because there's so many other things. Um, so to kind of recap, CARS is going to be taking each joint through its full range of motion. So in this case, with our neck, damn, I missed my long hair. Um, we're looking down. This is flexion. And then we're going to go into lateral flexion. We're rotating all the way up. So when I get people doing neck cars, as we go through, we're looking at making sure that, you know, our shoulders here don't move side to side. Cause I've seen that where people go and they get to that tight spot and their whole shoulder comes up. And it's also an opportunity for you to feel any tightness or any sharp pains, things like that. It gives you a lot of feedback of what's going on with your body. So the slower, the better. Breathing is super important here and really focusing on um, what feedback you're getting from your body. The other thing too that I'll mention in this video is I have my eyes closed. So naturally people do that when anything that comes to their neck. But when I get people in a, an assessment setting to do... Um, neck cars, I actually want them to be, uh, have their eyes open because sometimes when I work with people who've had, uh, concussions, uh, vertigo spells, I want to see what their eyes do. And if I see something out of the ordinary, then now I can start going down the pathway of like, okay, maybe this person had a car accident, never told me and they're 
medical history. Maybe the person's had vertigo. Maybe the person's had bad migraines and they did not tell me. And then this gives me more information because when it, especially when it comes to this position here, that can cause a lot of stuff. So if you get dizzy, if you don't feel good, if you get nauseous doing it, then that's when you should probably seek some sort of medical attention, either physio, chiro, whatever it is. Um, but that's just kind of a side note. Now let's go scapular cars. I'm just throwing out my old videos here. Might have to update these pretty soon. Oh, and I apologize for the ads, but so scapular cars. Oh, this is a one-armed version. You know what? I'm gonna detour. We're not gonna do this. I'm gonna find a newer video. Oh, here we go. So scapular cars, and again, all of these are gonna be somewhat standing because it's just easier when it comes to getting this done. So really it's just big shoulder rolls. So when you think of what the scapula is able to do, it's able to, in this case, retract, come back up, protract and back down, right? So we have protraction, retraction, elevation and depression. And that's what we're working on. The big thing here that I notice, because again, I get better every single year in my profession is I can spot out when I do mistakes. And that's the other thing too, is like when people look at my old videos, if they look at old podcasts and they'll point out like, Hey, you said this about this, 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 or you did this in your video, I'll be like, yeah, and that's wrong. So in this case, as I'm coming up, you see that I bend my elbows. That's a form of cheating. So when I do scapular cars in an assessment to see this is a compensation pattern that happens when people are trying to go into elevation and they don't have enough elevation and then they end up bending their elbows to mimic more height. And then I can already tell this, this is like over time that I've learned is like, I'm already pushing my head forward. And that's also another compensation pattern. So this is the kind of stuff that you should be feeling and also, um, be aware of when it comes to doing this. So let's see if I, yeah, so I kind of push my head forward and I'm bending my elbows. So I'm, at this point in time, I could be sore. I could have had a hard workout yesterday for my upper back. I could have, you know, maybe pulled a rib out and that's my compensation pattern. And again, this video was filmed. I'm trying to think, let's see the date in 2019. Right. So there has been some time since uh, I filmed this video, but these are the things that I'm always looking for. But overall, I'm moving my shoulder blades. And that's the other thing, too, is like when you start doing the morning routine, it doesn't have to be perfect. As long as you're moving, you're getting some sort of benefit out of it. So that is our um, scapular cars. Uh, we're going to move on to the shoulder. So the reason why this is called the updated shoulder car, just like anything else, things improve over time. So traditionally, when I first did my FRC, um, which is the functional range condition, which is kind of like their level one, two kin stretch, um, they taught um, shoulder cars where you just start going up and then back. But they added over time that, you know, your shoulder can go into adduction first and then go into flexion and all that kind of fun stuff. So that's why I have this called the updated uh, shoulder car. So in this, coming across, coming up towards the ceiling, rotating that hand all the way around. Knuckles are facing in and then we're coming back the same way. That is literally the hardest thing for people to do. So I'm going to stop it um, right at that point. So coming across, this is where a lot of people will also um, screw up. And I'm kind of doing it, but not really, is when you come across. And if you're tight, and it's usually guys who have big pecs, or if you have really tight pecs and a tight pec minor, and you're trying to go into adduction, your whole body will twist. And you can kind of see that my body's starting to, but it's not too bad. 
And as I come up, I start going into flexion, abduction, going into internal rotation right there. Now I'm gonna pause it where the hardest thing is. So I'm coming back, going from extension out of internal rotation to external, that like shoulder needs to be functioning so well. So you don't like do this thing to come back. And that's a compensation pattern that a lot of people do. And let's go play that one more time. And again, you can do this one arm, you can do it two arm. One arm's a little bit easier, so then you have more room for adduction. But uh, this is probably the one, like, especially in that position right there coming out of it, like you can already see that my torso is kind of leaning over. So again, this was filmed in 2020, right? And this was the year where the whole world shut down. And I was teaching Kim Stretch five days a week online. And I would say probably because of that, my shoulders, my hips move so well. Like as I'm moving my shoulder, nothing here is compensating. Like I can do a lot of weird stuff with my shoulders and I don't have any compensation patterns or going away or whatever it is. And like, you can even see like how my shirt is out this way how much of a difference that is, all right? So these are the things that you should also look at yourself when you're doing them. Like sometimes I'll tell people, do your cars in front of a mirror so you can see and also feel the feedback that you're getting. Now, let's move on because I can talk about this all the freaking time. So we're gonna go into T-spine cars. And sorry that I'm sniffly. I feel like I'm like fighting a sneeze that's about to happen. Okay, T-spine cars. This is another very difficult one. And I think this video is where I'm also talking into it. So in this, we're holding our shoulders, going into flexion. We're going to rotate our torso. We're going to extend backwards in that extended position, make our way over to the other side, and then mimic that same thing that we just did. And then back. The biggest thing here is as we're doing this, you can see that my hips are moving a little bit, but not to a point where I'm like doing one of these. I'm trying to move just the thoracic spine and not lumbar and not hips. So as I'm doing this standing, I'm squeezing the shit out of everything to make sure that I'm moving through just thoracic spine. This is probably one of the hardest ones to teach to get compared to that shoulder car. But the moment that you learn how to do this properly, game changer. Things just improve so, so well. And this is a good time to tell you guys that if you haven't checked out my other 10 exercises everyone should be doing, huge one. But I've actually put all of them together. And I think that was like my latest episode. That's like almost three hours. But if you want to go down a big rabbit hole, that's the one to watch. Or you can piece it together. And I think there's five parts or six parts. I can't remember, but definitely check that out. So T-spine cars. And now we're going to go into elbows and wrists. Go. So again, elbows are not super sexy and most of the people who do these will not feel like it's challenging because all your elbows can really do is flexion, extension and um, pronation and supination. So in this video, we'll go through it. So we're standing, I'm basically doing a bicep curl. We're gonna rotate forearms going back down into uh, extension, going back into flexion and rotating. The only time that I have seen this challenging is someone who I don't, is in construction, uses their forms a lot for um, hammering, screwing things in, uh, tennis players, 
baseball players or people who've had a traumatic injury in their shoulder and it sent a signal to the rest of their entire arm to stay tight. So pronating and things like that, or even full like elbow extension, they don't have. So everything is just tight as shit. Elbow cars tend to help. But a lot of times, most people who don't have those issues, this will feel like you're not really doing anything. But it's still important to move those elbows because if I don't move my elbows on a regular basis, bad shit tends to happen. Um, let's move over to wrist cars, which I feel is probably the most important thing to do. And let's go with this one. And again, I have so many different variations on these. So with this, the biggest thing is that your forearms should not rotate when you do this. So if you look at my forearms, they do not rotate. So a good example is like this eye here of my skull tattoo. It's going to stay in frame the entire time. Like it's not moving. It's staying where it is. So even with this, you can see, like, I always make the joke, like, think that your phone is on your forearm, don't let it fall. So now you're isolating just that wrist joint, and you're going through it over and over again. Our wrist is probably the most underrated um, joint there is. And when you think about it, every time you go into a push-up, mountain climbers, bench press, any pressing, any pulling, any pulling this way, your wrists get jacked up from it. So more reason to, you know, work on it. If I had any person that I've worked with, their wrists, they had it so tight through here that when they try to do wrist cars and they try to go in that whole forearm, if you look at my tattoo again, it rotates with it and they have no idea how to pin this back and just work through the wrist. So something to try at home on a daily basis. Um, we're going to move on to hips because that's another huge joint, just like the shoulder that we need to work on. Uh, oops. Now, I have so many freaking hip cars variations. There you go. I don't know what it is, but I'm getting a lot of ads on YouTube lately. All right, hip cars. One thing to note. Again, this was filmed in 2018, so things have changed. So this leg should actually start on the inside of this ankle to work on adduction and then hip flexion. So just note that. So we're coming up to hip flexion. Which by the way, that was terrible. <laughs> I can just see how much I've improved over time with doing kin stretch. Like, yeah, anyway, that's a side note. Now we're going into hip abduction internal rotation this is where a lot of people just lose it because kind of like that shoulder example where you know you use your shoulders up front here but when it comes back here you kind of don't know even know where your shoulder joint is in space and time and people usually kind of fall apart here but anyway you go into internal rotation coming all the way back into hip extension and then we're coming back the same way we came opening up that hip and coming back and notice how slow i'm going that's the speed that you should be doing all of your cars and people kind of speed through it especially hip cars in this position here where they try to go to internal rotation to extension and their leg kind of just floats really quick and it kind of just falls apart but when people get the idea and concept behind moving their hip joint in all different ranges, really good things tend to happen. Most of the time when people do this, they're leaning over. They are like, if I was holding onto this and people were opening up this hip and we'll see that in a second, they'll start leaning over to fight for more hip internal rotation. I'm doing that right now, right? Cause I'm not good at this at this point. 
you know, and I think honestly, I should probably do a before and after um, hip car video with this. And I think that'd be a great post to show like even me that is teaching all this, I've improved over time. But hip car is huge, huge. A lot of people, when they do this, they'll feel pinching and things like that. And anytime uh, I tell people that when you feel um, tightness, pinching, pain, imagine you're drawing a perfect circle with your joint. And as you're going, you're like, ah, oh, it's kind of tight. There's some pain, like create a buffer zone and then continue. And then your perfect circle kind of becomes this big weird blob thing. But you want to constantly like put some feedback into your um, nervous system that moving is not a bad thing. Like all you need to do is find that pain-free range of motion and you're going to be good to go. Now let us move on to knees and ankles. Okay. Knee cars. Again, this is an older video. Um, actually, you know what? I should be, I should have a newer one. Here we go. Knee cars are sim similar to our elbow. It kind of does the same thing. But in this case, the biggest thing, and I just did it, is watch my foot. I go into full dorsiflexion. The reason why is that I need to lock out that ankle joint. Imagine this is my foot. Lock out that ankle joint in order for my tibia to move. So in your knee joint, like your tibia is able to rotate both internal and external rotation. A lot of people don't have adequate, adequate internal and external rotation of their um, shin. And when it comes to running, lunging, squatting, deadlifting, everything, you need adequate rotation in that. And when people don't have it, guess what ends up hurting? their knees, their ankles, their hips, their low back. So it's like a lot of times you can just make this work a little bit better. Bad things tend to go away. So we're going into external rotation, flexion, internal rotation, back down. Oh, sorry, extension and deflection, right? Again, it's not a super sexy exercise, but when I try to explain to people that your knee can actually move, it's like, you know what I mean? So something really overlooked kind of like the wrists but when we get that going things tend to move a lot better you know there you go super sexy knee cars let's get into ankles because this episode's going to run really long if i don't get down to business all right ankle cars so the key here with ankle cars. Oh my God, these freaking ads, man. Is the position. So you'll notice that I'm locking my one forearm under my other hand on top. And then this hand locks onto my form. This is called a Kimura lock, meaning you're not going anywhere. So I'm basically locking out my hip, my knee joint to just get into my ankle. And nothing crazy. We're going into big ankle circles, but in this case, my knee can't cheat and my hip can't cheat as I'm going through this. Nice and simple, both directions. And again, the big thing here, when you go into those circles is to slow down the shakiness. Cause you'll notice right away that when this happens, like you'll go down pretty good. You try to go in and it's like, uh, go back up that's kind of like a disconnect of like your brain sending the signal to the muscles at work and it's not strong enough so the slower you can go in those sticking points or shaky points the better now to finish this off we also got to talk about toes probably the most underrated exercise ever uh here's a good complex that I did. There you go. All right. So in this video, I'm just doing big toe mobility, and then I'm doing the rest of the toes. And then I'm going big toe. And the rest of the toes. 
I'm doing switches. And I'm playing the piano. So with this, your big toe is the number one prime mover for propulsion, meaning producing power, pushing off. And that sounds pretty important to me when you think of running, lunging, walking, or anything that we do on our feet. Anytime that I test someone's active big toe, uh, range of motion, most of them can't move it. And then they tell me that they're a runner. And I'm like, does anything hurt when you run? And they're like, yeah, my shins, my knees, my hips, and my low back. And I'm like, hmm, I wonder why that is. Most underrated thing. And this is a whole topic on itself on um, like foot mobility, toe mobility, just toe exercises. And when it comes down to like footwear, you got to look at what you're wearing on every single day of your life. Because if you think about it, your feet are basically your hands. They're very identical when it comes to structure and even how many bones are in there. Um, but the difference between our hands and feet, our hands are exposed constantly touching things. There's variable movements and things like that. Our feet are mostly in socks and shoes all day. And then if you're wearing, say, heels that crush your feet into a triangle, even guys with like dress shoes, a lot of them have those pointy ends, same thing. You sometimes just need to have your feet free. So this is why I always tell people this is another exercise you should be doing. And I think this would be kind of a good place to end to kind of recap everything that we just did. We basically are working every single joint in your body that allows human function which in my head is pretty important to have. And if you think about it from the head down to the toes, if we move those every single day in their full capacity, good things will tend to happen. So when I do this, um, I usually go three to five reps of every, sing every single joint every single day. Start in standing. The only time that you're sitting is the knee and ankle cars. Yeah, sure, you can probably do it standing, but let's take balance out of the way. But literally, this is like the lowest hanging fruit that people can be doing is literally just moving their joints every single day. And huge, huge things will happen. And you'll notice that quality of life gets better. The quality of your lifts get better and pain goes down. Flare ups don't last as long. Like I can't talk enough about why it's so important to do your cars every single day, move your shit. That's what I've been saying a lot in my posts lately, just move your shit and things are going to work better. That's it for me, you guys, because I'm feeling ranty and if I keep going, but neck, shoulder blades, glenohumeral joint was your, your actual shoulder, uh, T-spine, uh, your hips, elbows, wrists, knees, ankles, toes, those 10. Do those every single day and you will be feeling better, moving better, and you're going to thank me. Do that every single day for the next six months. Guaranteed, you're going to see huge improvements. That's it. Uh, like and share this podcast. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Leave a comment. Uh, give me a thumbs up on there. Add me on Facebook. Add me on Instagram. That's it. Thank you guys for listening to me and ranting and mumbling around about joint health. Until next time, you guys.